who was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be. So we see that on this high feast that they were having on this particular Passover year when Jesus was crucified, he was not crucified on a Friday. I know that goes against tradition. He was crucified. If you look at the calendar and the, the Jewish calendar and the feast schedule, he was crucified and was in, he was crucified and in the grave three days and three nights, just like Jonah. If Jesus says Jonah's real, I believe Jonah's real. If the Bible says that God prepared a great fish to swallow him, I believe it. If the Bible said God prepared a minnow that swallowed him, I would believe it because God can do what I can't do. May have been the biggest minnow that's ever been. But when Jesus talks about the sign of Jonah, I know that Jonah is not a myth. He's a historical person. I know that he was swallowed by a large fish and he was given a second chance. And we see that this whole account ends on a cliffhanger. Have you ever gotten involved in a show and they end the season on a cliffhanger and then you get the news, oh, they've canceled that show. <laughs> so you just use your imagination and they lived happily ever after. But we see that God confronts Jonah about his priorities. You're more concerned about a vine than the souls of all of these people in this great city. And we don't know how that story ends. We're not given that in the word of God. It just ends. I have long thought I would like to speak to Jonah in heaven. But then I wonder, will he want to talk to me because I'm not Jew? I'm not a Jew. He wanted, he wanted Gentiles like me destroyed. Will he even want to talk to me? Is he even there? I believe he's there because why would Jesus talk about the sign of Jonah if Jonah didn't get right with God? So I believe that when he, was, when he had acted like such a spoiled brat child for so long, I believe it finally occurred to Jonah I should be concerned about the souls of all these people and not worry about the vine that is dead. That's why I think that Jesus could use the sign of Jonah. So we have your way, we have Yahweh, but then we have to decide which way are we going to go. Are we going to continue to be selfish? Are we going to continue to put our needs first? Or are we going to be like God who always shows love, who is merciful, who is patient, who doesn't want to punish people? So which way are you and I going to live? Your way or God's way? Has God told you to do something that you've not done? Mm -mm -mm. It's easy to jump on that Jonah bandwagon when he goes the other way, but then what happens if in the middle of chapter 1 of Jonah, we get convicted because God says, oh, what about what I ask you to do? Close that book, move on with the things to do list for that day. God knows everything. I say that a lot, but that means God doesn't forget. He chooses not to remember our sin when it's covered by him the blood of his son, but if God has ever told you to do something, called you to do something, you don't outweigh him and think, oh, I don't, I don't think he remembers that. That was a long time ago. A long time ago for us is a moment for him. Yeah. If a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day, you're not going to outweigh him or outlast him because our lifespan is too short. If God has ever told you to do something and you've not done it, you need to repent and do it. You know, we sing that song sometimes, who can stop the Lord God Almighty? 
And we're like, God asked me to do something, I'm not going to do it. Does that stop the Lord God Almighty? No. You know who it stops? It stops you. It stops you from getting the blessing you would receive for being a faithful and obedient servant. God chooses someone else, and they receive the blessing for what you refuse to do. But if you ever feel stuck as a Christian, perhaps it's because you need to go back to that place and repent. When we look at the, letter, the seven letters of the, se, se, the... Don't try this at home, I'm a professional. When we look at the letters to the seven churches of Asia Minor in, Minor in Revelation, we see the church at Ephesus received a letter that says, you have lost your first love. He says, you need to go and do your first works over. So if God's ever called you to do something and you've not done it, you need to start there to get unstuck. You need to go back there, ask for forgiveness, and do it. We expressed earlier that we gotten a second chance, maybe a third, fourth, or fifth chance. We've got another chance. How are you using this chance? Are you using it for the glory of God and the advancement of his kingdom? Are you taking advantage of this being given new life, being born again? Are you taking advantage of it or are you taking it for granted? Have you ever tried to tell God you were right? I don't recommend it. Because do you know that God can show you so many other areas in which we're wrong? You know, a broken clock is right twice a day, but all the other minutes of the day, it's wrong. And so if you ever try to tell God you were right, he will probably show you all the ways that you are wrong. Have you ever disobeyed God? Have you ever been angry at God? Today would be an excellent time to repent. Do you have your priorities right? Or does your life sound a lot like Jonah? In Romans chapter 7 and verse 15 in the contemporary English version, Paul writes, and these are very profound words to me. He says, in fact, I don't understand why I act the way I do. Did you ever have that why did I do that? Why am I doing this? Why am I acting this way? Why am I feeling this way? In fact, I don't understand why I act the way I do. I don't do what I know is right. I do the things I hate. And then we see in Galatians chapter 5 where Paul talks about walking in the spirit, not in the flesh. And he talks about the fruit of the spirit. And then he goes on to say in verse 24, and those who are Christ's, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. That's the crux of the discipline of a Christian life every day. You don't do it one time and be like, okay, mark that off, what's next? Every day we have to crucify the flesh. And I mentioned that crucifixion is one of the most barbaric forms of torture to execute someone in all of human history. But that's what we have to do with our passions and desires, our lusts. We have to crucify them. Or they will rule and reign in our mortal bodies. It's not really quiet in here. But that's the truth. Every day we have to put in the work to walk, not in the flesh, but in the spirit. And crucify those old sinful desire so that we can walk in the Spirit, be led of the Spirit, and minister through the Spirit of God to others. So here are my action steps. Put God's will over yours. It's not the first time you've heard it. It may not be the last time you hear it. Put God's will over yours. And then the second one, man by the name of Bob Pierce. I've told you about him before. He started uh, Compassion International. 
veered off the mission he had for it, so he started Samaritan's Purse. He was known for saying, God, break my heart for what breaks yours. That's when you have God's will over your will. When you ask God to break your heart for what breaks his. Be thankful for this chance that God has given to each of us and live accordingly. We're not guaranteed another chance. We have to do the best of our ability, and thankfully, God helps us. He doesn't just send us out there and say, good luck. (laughs) Come back if you're successful. He helps us every step of the way if we allow it, if we ask him, if we read and study his word, if we pray, if we minister in his name, because God is a gentleman. What do I mean by that? God doesn't force himself on anyone. If God forced himself on anyone, Revelation 3.20 would say, honey, you better get out of the way. I'm about to bust this door down whether you like it or not. But that's not what it says. It says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. Whose decision is it? Ours. Leave the door closed, open the door. What are we going to do? Which way are we going to live? Our way or God's way? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you today. And I pray for those that are hearing this message. Either in the room or at home or wherever they're listening from, watching from. God, we thank you first and foremost that you are a patient God, that you are a merciful God, that you are a loving God, that you don't want to punish us But God, you have given us a choice. We can accept this incredible invitation of your son, Jesus Christ, and we can have abundant life here on earth and live with you for eternity, or we can reject this plan of salvation. And you're not sending people who reject that to hell. They're sending themselves because they will not take advantage of this once-in-a-lifetime offer. So God, we thank you for who you are. And God, we thank you for the many times you've already had mercy on us. You've you've shown us tremendous grace. Because sometimes we act like Jonah, the spoiled brat, doesn't get our way. And God, we thank you for not giving up on us. So God, I pray that as people pray prayers of repentance and ask for your forgiveness, I know that you will forgive them cleanse them from all unrighteousness. But God, if these people, Lord, through your spirit would be reminded of a time that you've called them to do something, asked them to do something, shown them something to do, and we did not do it, then we repent. And pray, God, that you would continue to use us, that we would get unstuck from that point, and that you would use us in what time that we have left before the rapture or we go by way of the grave. And God, we just thank you and pray that you would just forgive us and help us, God, each step of the day, each step of the way, every day to crucify our flesh. The things that we want to do, we don't do those. We do the things we hate. So help us every day to show someone your son Jesus living in us. And we give you thanks and praise and glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. So as they play, would you just ask the Lord, is there anything, any wickedness in me, any sin in me, any evil way in me? God, would you turn your spotlight upon me and convict me of that sin so that I can ask for forgiveness so that you will forgive me and cleanse me? Holy Spirit, show me if there's any spot where I have disobeyed you, where I've not been obedient to you, where I've gone my own way instead of your way. And then ask the Lord this question. God, am I taking full advantage of this second chance you've given me, or third or fourth or 80th chance? Am I taking advantage of this life that you have given me that I am born again? 
justified as if I'd never sinned, made a new creature in you and adopted in your own family, am I doing what you want me to do?